Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I have the privilege to, uh, to have a presentation that uh, uh, was made uh, for this session, and I can do whatever I want because that was the rules of the game, so it's great. I can give you a perspective of uh, my last uh, 40 years in the uh, non-volatile memory industry. And uh, I took the liberty to uh, give you my humble opinion, but uh, I uh, support it. So it's a personal uh, view of uh, what have expired in the last 50 years. So why don't we start? First of all, I will uh, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Boaz Eitan, and I was uh, born in Israel. Uh, the ones that have difficulty in math, 69 in half a year. Uh, I was a fighter pilot in the Air Force, and I spent three years in Syria as a POW. It's not, it was not voluntary. Um, <laughs> I did a, a PhD, a master's and PhD in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and my professor was Dov Froman. You will see later on that it is related to the, uh, to the uh, field. And actually, we have here Asaf Shapir, whose his father was my professor too. And then I was in the NVM for 33 years, which means give or take, about nine years ago, I moved to another field, and I'll tell you about that, too. So I started as a student, and I got all the way up to a CEO, and the companies I worked for was Intel, WSI, Saifan that I started, and now I'm the CEO, owner, and chairman of the board of QCore Medical. It's in the medical device field, but I'm not going to talk about that. So... The first question came to mind, is it necessary for the NVM field to have such a history? Obviously not. And definitely helps. And I'll show you the difficulties, and you better be tough. So let's start. So I'll start from the start. There was a proposal in 67 by two very nice gentlemen. One of them, on the right, is very famous for a book, Z. Uh, I think many of us have had the opportunity to, uh, to learn about semiconductor devices through his book. So uh, they came up with a very brilliant idea. It, uh, you can see it's a floating gate, happened to be metal. There is a tunnel oxide, et cetera, et cetera. It's the normal floating a device as it, uh, they came up with it and uh, was, happened to be P-type, doesn't matter, and has a floating gate and tunneling, programming and erase. And many of you who know the field knows that uh, actually that's exactly what most of us were doing for most of their life. What was interesting to me was that they, they claimed retention more than one hour. So they felt like this is a big deal, that it retained the charge for more than an hour. You all know that today this would not be uh, great, and as you can imagine, never really worked. So the next thing that came to mind was the other obvious thing was MNOS. And then MNOS was also invented in 67, and believe it or not, Dov, who started Intel in Israel, was doing his PhD research on MNOS, improving MNOS. The, what is MNOS? MNOS is, again, transistor that have a very thin oxide, about 20 angstrom, nitride as a trapping layer and as a storage layer, okay? And then the the metal gate, and uh, it was a P-type device, and uh, tunneling was the uh, mechanism for program and erase, and uh, there were three little issues. One, the cycling window. Second, the retention. I will elaborate uh, uh, on it a little bit. 
and then a little thing which is called read disturb. As a result, they put two transistors. One was a memory transistor, one was a select transistor. And this didn't work. And why didn't it work? This is the retention graph uh, from way back. And there is little notification at the bottom of it. It says, this was taken at room temperature. And every time you saw an MNOS paper, it was in room temperature retention, which means that there is a problem. And indeed, the problem is that when you start elevating the temperature, you lose your window of operation too quickly, and this little problem was always there. There were attempts to solve this problem with structures like Monos and later on Sonos. But by and large, by and large, I, I can say uh, we are seeing at the very, very early stage that there is a story. There is the floating gate camp and there is the trapping camp. And believe it or not, you will see that this day and age, we still have camps, but the majority is switching sides. So it's just beautiful to see. I'm talking about if no one have made the algebra, this is 50 years ago. <coughs> Everything is new 50 years ago. And the improvement were to make it Sonos. What is Sonos? It was adding this oxide on top of the nitride to block the nitride, a, the charge from going from the nitride to the metal. And by doing this sandwich, O and O, all of a sudden, there was a device, a much better device. Far from being perfect, but really a device. And you see immediately the retention has improved. And um, I would say that this got all the way to small level production, no more than that. For special applications, military, space, things like this. And uh, at that early stage, definitely trapping was not the answer. So what was the answer? There was a breakthrough. Again, the gentleman is Dov Froman Benchikovsky. This is my professor. And he came with an idea that uh, putting a floating gate above a channel, this was a P-channel device. The programming mechanism was avalanche. There was a new idea to make the erase function. It's called UV erase. And this is why you see that the dye had a window, a quartz window, so that the UV light can get in. And uh, why was this a breakthrough? This was the first real NVM memory that went all the way to production, which is a big deal. And had good reliability, and had a, started an industry. It was called the EEPROM industry or the OTP industry, if you didn't want to have a window, a quartz window, which made it expensive, you block the whole part, the, the chip, and you can write it only one time. But at the time, this was a great deal. And as I promised you that this was a personal uh, presentation, so I already told you that uh, it cannot get any more personal than the one who started the floating gate era uh, was the one who uh, was my uh, professor in the university. But that's not the end of the personal thing. So let's summarize. Only the initial days. The two basic concepts, floating gate and trapping, programming, you heard tunneling, and also avalanche and UV. And reliability, only the floating gate was really good. And cells were one to two transistors. Uh, and in reality, the two transistor was prevailing. 
and the array was common ground. So later on, I'll discuss arrays. So the common ground array is the basic array. I'll later on explain how it looks. And uh, we have a nice start for the uh, NV NVM world. It looks today like nothing much, but I must tell you that uh, it was a, a very, very uh, big deal. And of course, there were many, uh, many questions. And at the time, we thought it's a very big industry. Of course, it was a small industry. And now we make one big jump from the very start of the uh, NVM world into the flesh, because flesh made the difference between a small world and a much larger, much more interesting uh, world. So I'll take you through the road to the flesh. And actually, it started with the double EEPROM. What's a double EEPROM? It's actually a transistor that uh, have a, uh, the floating gate with a tunnel oxide on top. It's, this is the memory cell. This is the select cell. And uh, it was invented in 1976. As you can see, it's a, it's a, a two transistor a cell. It's a byte programming and erase, which is very nice feature if you think the user, he likes this operation. It's the best from a uh, memory point of view. It's like an SRAM. Uh, both uh, programming and erased. The right was all tunneling, has a floating gate, and it was already an N-type. And believe it or not, the byte write is really great. What was not great was the cost because of large die to transistor high voltages and the low reliability. And uh, we'll show you a little bit uh, how this reliability issue was resolved without doing anything to the cell itself. And who invented it? Eli Harari. And he was at Hughes Aircraft when he did that. And uh, believe it or not, uh, you can see it, it's, it's downstairs. But I work with Ellie from 83 to 88 in WSI. So he is a personal friend. And as you can see, uh, NVM can become very personal. So it's a second one. So what was the problem with the EEPROM? The first thing was the gate coupling. The gate coupling. So you see a very sophisticated structure. And you see the. Uh, Floating gate was covered from all sides by the control gate, getting better coupling. The second thing was the tunnel oxide. And uh, we added a very special area for the tunnel oxide because of the issue of N plus tunnel oxide and an active dielectric. And actually, the cell became out of, we called it two transistor, but actually there was a third element in the transistor. It's almost like three transistor cell to resol resolve some of the reliability problems. The major one was to reduce the concentration of the N plus from the junction concentration to a standalone special implant just for the tunnel oxide. And, um, Last but not least, there was another idea to go uh, totally away from uh, all this uh, tunnel area above silicon and jump into a three-poly uh, concept that uh, you do programming and erase from the second poly between poly one, poly three, a highly complicated uh, concept. And, um, they, uh, all of these issues were not uh, resolving the basic, basic problem, which was one, large or costly, second, yield problem, and reliability problems. So the E-square was in production, never got even to the level of the EEPROM uh, uh, market size. And, uh, 
This is not the answer that we were all looking, though it's the first product that really the system designers like because of its functionality. So what's a flash? A flash was invented by taking the EEPROM thick oxide and making it a tunnel oxide. So this sounds like nothing much, but you will see that that's only step one in two steps. And what really made the difference was that the programming was by hot electron, which is like the EEPROM. And the erase, only the erase was done at a block level by tunneling. As a result, we went back to the one transistor cell, and now we are in the business of uh, making it cost effective. And uh, the fields, because of this asymmetry between program and erase, the asymmetry uh, really uh, uh, provided a low voltage operation and immediately a much, much better uh, reliability. And who invented it? Stefan Ley. Stefan Ley was working, again, on, uh, in Intel. He invented it in 83. And uh, the beauty of it is it's the same array as EEPROM and the same manufacturability almost like an EEPROM. So a lot of knowledge, not of one person, but of the entire company of how to manufacture high volume products was behind this concept. And I don't know if all of you know Avi Kolodny or Avinoam Kolodny as Professor Avinoam Kolodny as you guys are calling him here. Me and him were working together with Stefan Lake at Intel. And at least I, I don't want to blame Avi for that, but at least I told um, Stefan who came from IBM, he explained to me about this idea of his and I told him, this is a really lousy idea. You shouldn't go for it. Luckily for him, I moved to another company. So I'll show you the rest. It's really very nice history for him. So what is this history? You can see that actually from 86 to around 2006, the span of 20 years, Intel scaled beautifully this idea. They were, for a very, very long time, market leaders in generation after generation. So I am emphasizing who invented what, but actually that's a secondary thing because it's personal, it's interesting, but in reality, to make anything like this to production in generation after generation, it takes great many people with really great many ideas. In a minute, I'll show you a great idea that looks like nothing, and it is great. However, Intel really uh, made this to perfection, and uh, for many generations, more than anyone could anticipate, uh, done a very, very good job by very many people. And indeed, what happened, which is, this is the EEPROM market size, and see what happened in the transition to the flesh. And uh, Intel enjoyed this ride very much. There were little problems in this concept. As usual, they are little at the beginning when you are winning, and they become very big when you are losing. So what's winning? Hot electron programming is very high power. And uh, this is not good for if you want to do data. If you want to do code only, this flash is perfect. It's called code flash, and it is perfect. There is a little other thing that uh, I thought it's not so little, but you know, really great ideas made it look reasonable. The, there were, I, before I talked about gate coupling, now I'm talking about parasitic gate coupling. I'll show you later what it is. But making the cells closer to each other, they start talking to each other. This is no longer a cell. This is now an array. 
And so we'll talk a little bit more later on about what is this neighborhood thing. In any case, a breakthrough. I'm telling you, this sounds like absolutely nothing. What is this nothing? Rather than program the device, you do it what we used to call program and verify, or smart programming. What, shows, what is so smart about it? You program a little bit, and you ask the cell, how are you? Have you gone to the right level? If the answer is yes, stop programming it. If the answer is no, continue. It doesn't sound like much, but when you have a very fast cell and a very uh, slow cell, and you program all of them by making one pulse, one set of voltages, one length of time, it means that one cell will program very high and one cell will program very low. And the cell that program very high, you guys think is great. It's not good because there is too much charge there, high fields, reliability problem. And the cell that could make it, it's a yield problem. It is too slow, it didn't make it. So this was a, 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 a tradition of, you know, real men make product, you give one pulse and you forget about it. And uh, it didn't work for the E-square as I told you before. This little idea brought a lot of great things to the picture and uh, the only little problem with it, which was very strange to the memory design community, was that you have to, de to start designing a system on a chip. It's no longer just memory X, Y, voltages go on. It's now you have to have logic and you have to be able to change the logic and to improve it, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this, however, changed the world in two ways. One, it pro provided much higher yield and much higher reliability. And uh, I'm saying it so uh, enthusiastic about this triviality is because it is hard to recognize when it happens how big is something so simple, so nice. This is another outcome of uh, this little invention that I showed you. So if you, if you want to make more than one bit per cell, you see you do more threshold levels you cannot do it without a smart algorithm. It just, there is no hope to do it. And if you want to do three bit, and I'm not talking about four, only three. Now this is real challenge. This is no longer just a smart algorithm. Now you have to have some better concepts, but that's okay, you have a system on a chip. If you need to do error correction, error correction was not invented for flash, it was there. You just have to implement it, do a smart job. It's non-trivial, but it's, it's known to the, to the human race. So the great gain is when you move from one bit to two bit. When you move to the third bit, there is a much smaller gain than what you would imagine as another 50% because of the overhead. So. However, the solution of the three bit is absolutely perfect for data flash. And actually, if you need some area in the device to be very high reliability, you can make it a two bit cell or one bit cell. I mean, that, that's a, a, just a logic uh, decision. So really uh, a, a, a great progress and um, and that's how the world moved from EEPROM, that was nice, but no more than that, to something that was substantial, which is flesh. So at this time, we're talking about 1980s, 90s, and even the beginning of the, of the 21st century, the floating gate is the great clear winner. And uh, the market is dominated by the code flesh, and uh, I explained to you the hot electron programming, the non-symmetrical physics, 1T, very high reliability. And 
because it's the very same technology as it was for the EEPROM, high yield, everybody was happy, and the MLC was a great breakthrough on that, uh, in, as to add a one more layer of uh, density to the uh, memory array. So we are really having a very nice progress. You don't pay attention to it, but we are almost 30 years later to where we started. So that's what it takes, tenacity. It's not, yeah, I have a friend who is saying that uh, to make an instant success, an instant success takes 30 years of hard work. So th that's how the industry uh, progressed. This is not a one or two uh, great ideas. This is a lot of people doing really great job. So let's talk a little bit about the neighborhood because the neighborhood has a lot to do with the continuous scaling of uh, NVM. So I'm starting with what was the workhorse of the industry for many, many years, and even today it's a very important one. It's called the Common Ground Array, and what's common about it is a diffusion line, and what's uh, special about it, especially in a negative way, is that every cell have half a contact Every memory cell have half a contact belonging to him. Contact technology is not a happy technology. It's a complicated one. And then you have to put it next to two polygates, and uh, at least at the time that this was uh, done, it was not an easy process. So the beauty of the common ground array, however, it is very simple to operate. And then it's also very fast access time inherently. And of course, the limitations are the contact and the etching of the two uh, poly, and always this little thing that is called coupling, and whoever is not in the field wouldn't even pay attention to it, but there is a floating node that makes the difference. This is your gate that controls the zero and the one. And if the neighborhood affects it, uh, you may get the, an error in your information. So, the amazing innovation was to continuously scale this array for, I would think, at least three or four generations more than at least I believed is possible. You will see that I didn't like it and I went a different way. So first different way is virtual ground array. So what's uh, what is virtual ground? Virtual ground means that you have a memory cell and if this is the drain, uh, this is the source. But if this is the drain of the next neighbor, this is the source. So actually, there is no source line. There is only drain for each transistor, and there is no source, dedicated source line, which in the common ground array, there was a dedicated source line. And uh, however, to make it work, we needed a, what is called a split gate transistor, an asymmetrical device. So I was actually talking about uh, array, and I ended up telling you about yet another uh, memory cell. And uh, indeed, in 1985, we at WSI made it to volume production, and uh, it was uh, working, and uh, it has a lot of benefits. One of them is that it is not sensitive to the gate coupling. And, uh, I did it with Eli Harari uh, at WSI, and we have ST Microelectronics in, uh, in uh, Italy doing it, and we had the Sharp Corporation in uh, Japan doing it. And actually, uh, this is a very, very nice idea, and it was uh, the same uh, mechanism as uh, the, this was good for EEPROM, uh, and it was a virtual ground array. However, 1987 came an absolutely amazing idea. I will discuss a lot more about this idea. It's called the NAND array. What's a NAND array? So remember the, the common ground array with the contact? Everybody knew that this is not a good idea, this contact. It's too much work and too much area. So a NAND cell is, these are memory cells, one select, two select, 
common ground array, but for many cells. The chain was at the beginning eight cells, 16 cells, 32 cells, you name it. So now every cell in the array is a memory cell, and it's also a pass transistor of the information of its neighbors. So, for example, if you want to read this cell, all of these other neighbors are pass transistor for it. It's unbelievable how complex this thing is. It's actually, it shouldn't work. This is not a good idea. So, as a result, there were very high voltages to make it really a product, 20 volts, while the rest of the industry was around 10. And uh, of course, you cannot program neither byte nor page. You have to program a much larger page and you can only do block erase, and a lot of disturbs, a lot of disturbs. So when we uh, saw the paper by, by Masauka from Toshiba in 1987 IDM, we thought that this is crazy, absolutely non-practical idea. And uh, we, it's not just me, the royal we, it's also Eli Harari who owns now a fab that is doing it day in, day out. So when it came about, that's what's funny about it. When I talk about NEN today, everybody thinks this is, uh, this was, you know, was it before the day and night were invented or after? It sounds like it was always there. It was not always there. It's just 20 years and it sounded like a very bad idea. So the difference is, of course, the time. And uh, there is one more array. It's called Crosspoint Array. Most of you have never seen a product with it for a reason. But uh, this is the true 4F square cell. And uh, you can have the entire CMOS array underneath it. You, d you don't, it's all in the metal le levels. So it's a beautiful idea, and how it works, you have a bit line and a word line, and this junction, assume that there is a programmable resistor. That's all what it is, a programmable resistor. And uh, if you can program it and read it, how can you make anything smaller than this, simpler than this, even fast? It can be very, read very fast. So. Why haven't you seen anything with this concept? There is one little problem, is the neighborhood of this uh, uh, cell, because I will show you more, all the neighbor cells are also conducting. And to make a readout of it is non-trivial at all. And uh, to make it work, to make a programmable resistor between two metal lines, must be a very, very simple uh, concept, physical concept. So the physics of it requires very tight uh, control on the uh, voltages. And uh, while it's very simple, has a lot of disturbs. I want to uh, tell you that this day and age, Intel is claiming that they will do this for replacing DRAM. I put a question mark on it because they're not the first to try because it's so attractive. And a question mark, is it really going to replace DRAM? Is it really going to get to the cost structure? But I want to give you a little bit more feel of it. So what you see here, this is the cell that you want to read. So what do you do with the neighbors? So this is word line and this is bit line. What do you do with the neighbors? So the neighbors, you see, you by and large put what is called half voltage, which means that this neighbor, the green one, sees the bit line voltage and half of the word line voltage. So this means that this should not affect the data in the neighboring cell because all of these cells are not to be affected, but also not to drive a lot of current. 
And now I can go along a bit line and along a word line and ask you how many word lines do I have to put in half selects so that the total current from all of this very large neighborhood is not going to affect your data. And the worst case is when all of the data in your neighborhood is a, a what is called low resistance and your one cell is high resistance. So there is a true great difficulty and it's, it's really complex. On the right, you see a different concept where you use coupling to make a, the, the, the half selects to be uh, without driving them to a half select, but the problems are very similar. So to make it reasonable disturb, you have a very complex select. Uh, at the end of it, to resolve the neighborhood thing, you just start segmenting the array. So you put smaller blocks so you don't have too large of a neighborhood. And um, sometimes people offer a differential cell, which means two cells per bit to make the read and more a, a deterministic. Of course, this is not a good idea if you want to scale. And, uh, some concept, I'll show you, they have a select transistor. So you have a memory element, a select transistor, and then of course, again, we are back to a larger array and this doesn't work. And then Intel wants to do it now, not one dimension, to do it 3D. So to make, you see if this is the bit line of this, it's also the word line or bit line of the layer above and so on and so forth. And you can now imagine any many layers as you see fit. But remember, now your disturb also goes into this direction. It's no longer a, an innocent uh, case. So it's, it's non-trivial and um, we used to have a saying that uh, when somebody would come with this idea at Intel while I was working there, we used to say, if you have half selects, it means you have no select, which means don't do it. Just don't do it, forget about it, as simple as that. And now everybody says, oh, this is obvious. I mean, this is great, uh, a brilliant idea. So if they solve it like usual, if they solve this problem, of course they have a very, very important breakthrough in their hands. And if they don't, they can afford it. Here you see the condition on the, uh, on the read. And I'm, of course I'm not gonna take you through all of this. I just want to show you what neighborhood means. It's N and M, which means N and M bit lines and word lines that participate in how much leakage current you have from the neighborhood. And you have now to decide how many of these N and M you can uh, afford before you break the array, and breaking the array means you increase the die area. So it is well-known concept. When I saw that this is what they're doing, I say, oh, I've seen it. Not 40 years ago, maybe only 35 years ago. And uh, it was never in production just because of this neighborhood effect. So, Let's summarize. The market drives the architecture. Code flash stays NOR array. The data flash, by far the NAND array. DRAM replacement, cross point, we'll see. I'm not sure. Embedded. Embedded is a big story. We haven't discussed it, but it's a big story. We haven't discussed it because uh, there is an issue there. Do you want to do a special technology for embedded? Then you don't have the money, enough money behind it, enough resources behind it. And if you use the dedicated memory technologies, you find out that you have too many process steps, too high voltages, non-practical. It doesn't serve a good uh, solution for having on the same die real logic and real memory. 
So the dilemma is still there. It is not resolved. There are embedded uh, products, but in my opinion, the issue is not resolved. And uh, you can see we are almost there. We are doing good. So cell concepts. NAND and NOR, we discussed it, and uh, I'm only uh, looking on the gate coupling here and the gate coupling here. Both arrays have very similar issues with the gate coupling, and um, let's explore it so that you understand what is the problem. So what is the problem? The problem is the relations between the two cells and the charge that you have on the floating gate. So two floating gates that are in the same neighborhood are applying electrical field on each other. Now, it's always uh, something that you have to remember that when you program bit number one and then you program bit number two, three, four, and so on and so forth, the first neighborhood, this is not a very large neighborhood, but it's the first neighborhood, as you scale down, these are playing a great role in the outcome of what you do. And what you see here, you start, from, for example, from an erased cell, and slowly, actually, an erased cell become more and more programmed. You can imagine that your window of operation is shrinking, or that you need a larger window, and this is not a solution. And of course, with a lot of ingenuity, there are many, many good ways to somewhat overcome it, but it never goes away. It is a difficulty. At the end, you call it, uh, can I do three, three bit per cell? Uh, is it a reliability problem? But there is a name to it, but it is there. So the problem is that the scaling is working against you in two ways. It's more difficult to keep the coupling between the gate and the floating gate. And then the neighborhood, of course, is becoming more and more friendly. I mean, closer and closer. So it goes against scaling. I think we knew it uh, for a very long while. And then if you put it on top of an end array, I just, I want you to respect the people. Normally they are young engineers. The old engineers can not take it anymore and they probably go somewhere else. But to read a bit here, you see, or write it, doesn't matter. You put 20 volts in this case to write. You put select transistors on your gates, and you have to live with a very small window between program disturb and pass disturb. So you are working, I'm talk, I was talking about neighborhood coupling. All of a sudden, you also have to take care of this. Wow and people are making it uh, to really high volume production in an unbelievable way, and it takes really a great belief and a lot of work. So yes, it is working, and uh, everything has to be very good, process control, the system on a chip, error correction here, of course, and uh, you have to accept that there is reduced reliability with it, but that's okay. It's, Reduced reliability is taken care somewhat by the error correction. So the situation is definitely impossible, but definitely was made possible. And uh, for the last 20 years, data flash is controlled by the floating gate NAND. But I didn't like it. So. We at Saifan came with a, uh, a very nice idea. It's called a uh, NROM. It's a trapping device. So you remember, we started trapping. We told you it doesn't work. We went uh, about 30, more than 30 years forward, fast forward, and here we come. And we have this brilliant idea that uh, trapping is the, is the way to go. And what did we do? We did the following. First of all, we did the first breakthrough was to have two physical bits 
in one transistor. So there is no more playing games, you know, multi-level, all of this stuff. Really two separate bits. And the dielectric, the, the memory cell, is just an ono, a known technology for many, many years. For example, floating gate to word line is an ono. So we have not invented the ono. We have not invented the transistor. But we did invent something that was very, very interesting. It's called a read-through. So you read the device here through the bit here. And I will show you without affecting each other. So we thought it's a brilliant idea. It's uh, uh, all the goodies. It's hot electron programming, asymmetrical. It's hot hole arrays, unbelievable. It's virtual ground array, wow. It's all. I mean, anything puts together. And uh, we believe that this can be done. And indeed, we had very many uh, companies who uh, uh, did this, um, including Tower here in uh, Israel, uh, Infineon, and Spension took it to volume production. Till today, still in production. So what I'm showing you here is actually this is uh, bit number uh, one and bit number one and two in programming. So what I'm showing you is when you program one bit, the second bit stays erased. And when you program the second bit, the first bit stayed programmed. So it really worked it, as if they are totally independent, separate two bits. And uh, the erase was done uh, at a block, as a block erase, and it, it was working very nicely, but you could even do the erase per bit. So what was the motivation? Who motivated us to do it? So all the knowledgeable people, and that's what's nice about knowledgeable people, they said it will not work. But if you make it work, wow. So what is there more to motivate one when all the experts say it won't work? And you have heard it on any field everywhere. It's always there. It's always. What? It's always the stuff from very before. Of course. Of course. No, I'm, I'm not innocent. I'm, I'm OK. Right? So really, uh, you know, we have here some of my great friends from those days at Saifan and uh, in Infineon and uh, in Tower. And uh, it was really a very beautiful ride good retention, good endurance, and really localized trapping. So the second breakthrough was localized trapping. What do I mean by localized trapping? Actually, you, you see, to make it two bit, you have to program the bits next to the junctions, and it has to stay there. Now it has to stay not only moving downstairs to the silicon or upstairs to the gate. But also, you cannot afford to have a lateral movement. Because if you have a lateral movement, you still lose the information. So we found out that this is doable. And the first time we've done it, we've done it here in tower uh, semiconductors. and. Uh, this is very important. Why is this very important? Because I'll show you how the world progresses. And uh, actually using this as a main runner for the future of NVM. So we made four bits out of it. But now you only have to program two bit per side, not four bit, which is 16 levels, only four levels. It's tough. Let's, but there were products in the market with it till today. They are mostly one-time programmable. But as usual, there is a but. In retrospect, this is so trivial, like you couldn't believe it. But very high power, hot electron, and uh, not practical for data flash. It is still in production for code flash today. 
So here we are back to NAND, and there is a 3D NAND, and it all looks unbelievable that anybody would dare do 48, 40 some layers to make a 32-bit chain vertical. Uh, they're talking about 64-bit vertical and 96 bits vertical. It's easy to say. It's super complicated to do, super complicated. And in reality, and this is my belief, the only way one can even consider it, in my opinion, is if you do a charge trapping device. If you want to stick to your floating gate, in my opinion, you are getting into real trouble. I mean, this is very complex. I'm not saying that doing it with trapping is easy. No, it's not easy. It is crazy. But that's where the world is going. So my opinion is the simplicity of Ono can uh, provide it. And to make it to the densities we're talking about, actually, they are doing localized trapping because the layer is a continuous layer. And if the charge will move sideways, there will still be a big problem. However, this concept is, it is going to be there. That's no two ways about it. But to make it to the yield level that make it cost effective relative to the existing technology, a big challenge, a huge challenge. And again, it takes a lot of belief, tenacity, and a lot of dollars to make anything like this reasonably uh, working, reasonably yielding. And uh, I'm sure some of the people here in the audience think that this is not such a big deal because they are working on it and they can see how it works. And there is something to work with, but great difficulties. I'm showing you more of it. And uh, due to time, uh, I will uh, jump. And I think this is the clear winner. I mean, there is no two ways about it. Planar uh, technologies for NAND applications will not stay around. The, in my opinion, the next wave, and I don't know for how many years, but definitely for many, many years, will be uh, this three-dimensional array with uh, uh, charge trapping as the main uh, 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 runner. However, there are many, many other cells. I'm not going to go through all of them, but FERAM, PCRAM, MRAM, PRAM. I'm, I'm talking uh, English. If you haven't heard all of these acronyms, many, many ideas of how to make the ultimate memory. And again, I. I'm not even going to try to tell you how each and every one of them works, but what's the motivation? Actually, what can be better than having an SRAM, which is non-volatile? How great it can be if the DRAM will be non-volatile. And low voltage operation, and compatible with CMOS, and if we can do it at the back end and not at the front end, I mean, this is really changing the world. Why not successful? First of all, new material. Every process engineer loves new material. Actually, he hates it because he knows to take new material to production is as close as mission impossible as it can get because of the interaction with the rest of the process. And nobody is paving the way. The flesh and the DRAM keep on moving very hard, scaling very hard. They're not saying, oh, you have this great idea. Why don't you come in? Here is the open door. On the contrary, it's a very tough competition. So none of these technologies, as we speak today, are in real volume production. There's, just to give you a feel for it, for example, a phase change device, you change the conductivity of a resistor by moving it from an amorphous phase into a crystalline phase. And now you have to do it if you really want to make it uh, 
a DRAM replacement or a, let alone SRAM replacement, you have to do it 10 to the 15 times in the lifetime of this product. This, this is major, major difficulties. So the, all of these concepts have scaling uh, difficulties, very high power is on some of them, lower power on others, cycling limitations, and there is always for each one of them some other little like, problems that uh, whoever tries finds out it's really difficult. Another one that is the, the one that uh, is being tried now is using a relatively simple uh, titanium oxide. Now the idea of the memory is to program the thickness of the layer between uh, a full uh, titanium uh, dioxide to a, a some missing oxide and moving the layer by programming an erase changes the resistance because one layer is high resistance, the other one layer is low resistance. So you change the, the data by changing the thickness of the layer, the transition moves uh, back and forth. So uh, again, the same uh, advantages, very dense, all the good things are there and all the disadvantages and again, no time uh, to go deeply into it. So, the arrays, 50 years, actually just handfuls of devices. There are not 30, 50 devices that were in production, handful. A lot of energy went into each and every one of them to make it. Floating gate was absolutely the workhorse for the last, the first 40 years. And uh, I believe and I hope that trapping will be the workhorse for the next 40 years. And I also hope to stay around to see it. And uh, is this idea of replacing one more level, not all uh, volatile memories, but some part of it, cache level two, three, with something else, very difficult. And uh, during uh, my tenure, too many concepts, too many concepts that were promising for the last 40 years. So if you think that FRAM, FERAM is new, no. And if you think that MRAM is new, no. Every time we came with this NROM, everybody would ask us, and what about this and what about that? There was always a company there, there was always a promise there, and it stays as a promise. So hopefully, it will change. But what I'm trying to say, to make something new into this field is not just difficult because it is really difficult. It's also difficult because nobody's waiting for you. Everybody is pushing very hard to not let you in. And you know, in, in Israel, uh, when somebody brings a uh, 99, his mother would ask him, why not 100? So there is no hundred in this business. There is always a but. And because there is a but, as I showed you, uh, there is always a hope for the next great idea. Very quickly, the product, as you can see, the EEPROM age, the NORFLESH age, starting to look like a market. And guess what? Beautiful, beautiful uh, business. This is, uh, I believe, almost uh, the size of half of the Israeli budget So for one industry. So pretty good. And uh, the functionality is great, and all of us are using it now in their laptops, uh, cell phones, what have you. Just great. And the evolution I showed you starting from the first idea through all of these cells that we have discussed in this short presentation, maybe not to the great lengths that it deserves, but just remember, by the end of the days, there will be no electrons to store. And uh, that's a limitation, short of inventing a new charge. So you see the North stays with quite a bit of electrons stored, and that's why the reliability is very good. 
in the NAND, there are very few electrons left. And it doesn't matter if it's a trapping NAND or a, or a uh, floating gate NAND, it's very few electrons. So it is challenging. It, it, you know, people talk about it as if uh, this is just walking in the park and whoever is the winner looks on everybody else and say, oh, these miserable people. But as long as you're the winner, you're happy. But it is tough, very, very tough. And don't get afraid because it's working. And uh, as I showed you, so few concepts, last 50 years, such a few amount of them really made it. So if you have a great idea, don't just think positively how it will work. That's tough enough. What will make it not to work is as important as what makes it to work. And to get both of them into product to production, it's really wow. Final thoughts, density. So you see the planar technology definitely is slowing down. And it's not because it's easy to move from here to here. It's really a lot of work, a lot of money, a lot of good work of many, many people. And the, uh, the vertical one, you see, it's projected. It's projected to go on and on and on. Many doubt the 96, some doubt the 64, because it's not 64 layers. It's a chain of 64. There are many more layers there. So uh, this is uh, really hitting the scaling limitation uh, due to this one of these issues. And there are a few more. And the same for uh, the cost. The cost is just the reflection of the same story in here. And if you didn't get it, I believe that the, what is called 3D trapping NAND is the wave. And uh, if you want, I'll tell you that I am not very optimistic about this technology. I can afford it. Who are the winners? That's it. Serial NOR, clearly, the 2-bit NROM, still also a floating gate. But it's a small market, stayed small. Data memory, the main market, we talked about it. DRAM replacement, very tough. And embedded, still an open question. That's beautiful. I mean, there are solutions, still a big question. And since it's a personal thing, it's tough. If you didn't get it from my presentation, it's OK. But uh, it is tough. It's amazing. It's very demanding. And then I moved to the medical device about 10 years ago. Believe me, it looks simple. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>